um, arts for our students to explore best leadership practices through one-on-one -on -one interaction with community leaders and decision makers to help the students develop their leadership toolbox um, to encourage peer-to-peer -peer learning um, and civic engagement and to gain an appreciation for giving back. So we achieve these goals um, through a curriculum that is based on the five practices of exemplary leadership, um, which is the leader Student Leadership Challenge. And so um, each of our monthly sessions focuses on one of those challenges. So um, model the way, inspire a shared vision, challenge the process, enable others to act, encourage the heart. So students are also challenged to examine their own leadership actions and aspirations through these monthly sessions and complete a community service project. So um, one of the sessions in particular, um, the October session, Model the Way, we were honored to have um, Dr. Smith serve as one of her presenters for that. And during that session, he kind of issued a um, call to duty or call to action, which one of our students took to heart. And so as a result of that, um, he made a difference on his campus and helped his own leadership journey. And so Belton Langia, he is actually a student at leadership, or at um, the, our North Paris campus, and he's here to share a little bit about his experience. My name is Belten Langmia, and I've been a part. Of, I'm part of the leadership college for this year. Being part of the leadership college has been an exciting experience, and I've learned so much on how to be a leader and a follower, and also to encourage others to move forward. An interesting aspect about the leadership college is that we are all encouraged to align our actions with our words because it is our character that earns us respect and not our position. And in our October session last year, I met with Dr. Smith, who gave me great tips on how to be a leader and how to improve my community. He told me to express my voice through elections and to encourage others to vote. So I convinced other student leaders on campus so we could do a community project registering other students to vote. We started by attending the one-hour state-mandated training for deputy voter registrars, and then got our certificate of appointment from the Harris County Tax Office. This year, on the 23rd and 24th of January, we held our first voter registration on campus, and we registered 105 students. I'm in. 105 students. Excellent. And awesome. we, still, we still plan on continue, we will continue to do that throughout the semester. And the Leadership College has given me so much values that I try every day to use it to improve my life, my family, and to help my community back in Cameroon. I was born in Cameroon, Africa, before moving here two years ago. And I'm also excited to be here today. Thank you. Elder, Elder, step back up. Some of my colleagues may have questions or comments. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Did, you, did, you, did you play soccer? Sorry? Did you play soccer? Yes, sir. Yeah? <laughs> <laughs> did you study English before moving here? No. I you started, didn't? I started English last year, 2016. You've done very well yes. in two years. Yeah. Very well. And, and Elon, I want to say one of the things I enjoy doing is bragging on other individuals. And when you sent me the email about what this group had done as far as registering people, yes, I thought, you know, that we had to get you and your group <clears throat> before this forum so they can see the wonderful work that's going on out there in the community by young people. And when I mentioned this to you guys, I did not think anything, I shouldn't say it this way, I didn't think anything would happen that quickly. And not only did you do good things as a result of this, I've gotten other telephone calls from individuals in that group that have done the same thing. And as I always tell folks, maintain that momentum because you can make a difference. And I think I also told you that when I was with my 
when I was working full time, I spent a year over in the Cameroon. So, so I'm very familiar with your, your culture to an extent. And I admire you coming over here and getting immersed in studying and working to improve the system. So keep up the good work to the others that are involved, the sponsors and et cetera. You know, uh, let's make a change, even if it takes us making that change with one student at a time. Amen. Things don't, do not happen automatically overnight, but doing it one at a time will make a difference. Thank you and keep up yeah. the good work. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Do we want to introduce the other, oh, well, let me rephrase that. I would like the other student. Do you want to introduce the student? Okay. Uh, okay. You probably need to speak in the mic. Okay, when I say your name, just stand. I'm Dee Dee Fisher, Alicia Harper, Sayuri Hull, Felton, Zachary Mokin, Robin Northover, Benny Tananiya, and Joy Vello. So this is just a portion of the number of students that we accept, so. I'd like to make a suggestion. You took the training to be deputy voter registrars. Every time there's an election, and we have a primary coming up, first Tuesday in March, general election in November. There is a need for poll workers, election clerks, and often those positions go wanting, and it slows the process down. So you might consider <coughs> taking the training uh, to be um, election clerks at the precincts. Just a suggestion. Yeah. It does pay. <laughs> ah, okay, oh, yeah, Dr. Napolis, you know, when I suggested, you know, to the students that they do that project, and Elon didn't say it, but I told him to make sure you talk to the campus administrators before you go off and do things, and I presume they did that, and everything worked out just great. <laughs> but, thank you. Do we have anybody from the newspapers tonight? No? Yeah, okay. So that's it for that one. No workshop, right? Okay. Okay, at this time, uh, we will ask for a motion and a second to approve the minutes of our December 7th workshop and regular meeting. So moved. Second. It's been moved and properly seconded, and we approve the minutes of December the 7th. Any comments, questions? If not, vote by the usual sign of aye. 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 Opposition by the same sign. Motion passed. <coughs> Dr. Head, we're back to you with any special reports and announcements. So, yes, and Jennifer, if I could, if I could push two of them together at the same absolutely. time. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jennifer, if you want to come up a minute and talk, um, let me give you a quick update. First of all, we just got back from a national conference at AACC on workforce development, and we were the, our college was the featured college to begin the conference on workforce development. We are one of the leaders in workforce development across the country and one of the models there. And Gerald and Zilpa, and we had uh, Mary Beth uh, uh, Steve back here from, um, we had Beth Thompson, and I think that was that Linda head. So anyway, you, um, we are among the very elite colleges when it comes to workforce and what we're doing. And we also, we're going to have a workshop at the next meeting. If you haven't seen anything yet, you've seen a couple of uh, newscasts coming out. We are in the process of training 4,000 workers as part of the Rebuild Houston. So we received a large grant on that. So we're working on, uh, um, the construction trades. Most of that training is occurring over at North Harris. So, yep. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So, we'll, we'll get an update over that next time. So, let me just talk to you about it for a second where we are with the enrollment issue. 
that's related to the hurricane and kind of where we are with everything. So our headcount was about flat this semester. Our headcount was. Our contact hours were down slightly, which means our, and, and the reason I'm telling you this is because of the note that we've sent out. And we want to go ahead and take care of our budgeting right now. And so we're, we're, uh, we're down about uh, a little less than maybe three, or about 3% in our contact hours for this semester. I was not surprised. This is the after effect of the hurricane. I think this is a, a just, it's what happens with the hurricane. So overall though, we budgeted for about a 4% increase for the entire year, and it looks like we're, we're going to be less than 4%, but I want to make sure the board and everybody else knows that we thought this might happen after the hurricane. I thought we were very fortunate when enrollments went up after the hurricane. We gave out 1.2 or $3 million last semester. And uh, right now, the city of Houston, by the way, gave us $100,000 recently. And we have 20, almost 2,800 applications for the money right now. And I'm looking at Helen and Nicole Robinson, who are, it's going to the foundation, but we'll be awarding another $100,000 for hurricane relief, so we're doing what we can do. But I wanted Jennifer, uh, to, I wanted Jennifer to talk just a second. Anything, add anything you want to. But I want to, if you would update the board over where we are with Kingwood and what's what's occurring there. Okay, so I have updates for both Kingwood and our efforts for the FEMA public assistance. Uh, so first, on Kingwood, uh, going through our timeline there. I think I had already mentioned in December is really when we got the clean notice from the hygienist on uh, the buildings there. Uh, so now we are completing the dental hygiene build out for the temporary space for the dental hygiene. And we are beginning to occupy the first floor of the administration building. That way we get some room for the administration that's been in conferences and, and the like. So we are continuing to work through everything. Um, we are going to be coming in the next uh, couple of months uh, for board approval on the construction contract on Kingwood um, with the timeline still to have the buildings open in January of 19. Um, and then Let me make I sure everybody knows that. That's January of 19, about a year, before Kingwood is fully, fully functional. So... Um, we're moving at the pace we can move at right now. It's just a lot of work going on over there. So. Um, yeah, and I mean, so the other thing I think to mention is uh, about around May is when we expect to have the second floor of the library open up. That way some additional classes can take place there. Um, but in terms of the major reconstruction, yes, the architects are working now um, and we're going through the bid process for the construction contract. You'll see that in the next few months, and then see construction begin to have that ready for January 2019 for Kingwood. So, um, you want to talk about where we are with FEMA? FEMA. So FEMA, um, I'm actually feeling, considering, feeling good about. Uh, <laughs> so FEMA, right, the hurricane was on August 25th. Yeah, I just went back through our timeline of what we've accomplished so far. With the hurricane being on August 25th, we filed the request for public assistance on September 6th. And then a month later, October 6th, we had the contract executed with the consultants, GP Strategies, to help us with um, all, every, all the work we have to do with FEMA. Um, so then October 20th, we were able to submit the first draft of the damage inventory uh, to FEMA. And so that damage inventory, the latest uh, version of it that we have with FEMA has costs, total costs at 34 million that we've that's, submitted. That's for Kingwood or that's everybody? That's for everybody. And that includes uh, damage over at Cypher due to the wind? Yes. And damage over at uh, University Park? And North Air, and some and damage at North Air, yes. <coughs> um, that, that includes all um, because we've passed the deadline of submitting the initial damage inventory. So that list includes everything that we've identified at this point at all locations. Um, so we, October 20th, we submitted the first draft of that. And then um, 
Uh, gen just this past January 18th and 19th, FEMA did its site visits for Kingwood, and they completed three of the six buildings on that site visit. Uh, January 29th, FEMA did their site visit at Sci Fair. On the 30th, they did their site, their site visit at UP, and they're scheduled to do North Harris on February 5th, and then the remaining buildings at Kingwood on February 12th. So we're also working through all of their site visits. And I mentioned, so there's a couple of steps. First is submitting that damage inventory, which total we're showing 34 million. Now, for that 34 million, for every dollar of it, we have to submit project worksheets, which is all of the backup documentation. Um, so for that, we've already submitted uh, the first chunk, 9.6 million, we've submitted in project worksheets to FEMA, and they are currently reviewing that. Um, we have a feeling they're gonna come back for some additional documentation on some of that, but we're also beginning work on the, the second batch of project worksheets for another 10 million. So, like I said, when I sat down and went through the timeline of what we've accomplished so far and where we're at with FEMA, um, I was feeling pretty good about it. We're, so it's we're doing what we can do right now. Um, we'll come back once Kingwood's ready to go. Mm -hmm. We'll come back with a plan one way or another, whether FEMA has given us money or not, we need to get moving on Kingwood one way or another. I'm, I'm stating that publicly so we can get, we know we have, have that college open. We know that. So you're seeing the impact of it right now with us reducing the budgets right now. And that we think right now that that number is not going to be 5 million, 5.1 million. Our enrollments are looking a little better, but we still, we know, we know that we did not uh, hit our goal with tuition and fees. So we are going to be reducing the budget right now. And I, as I stated before, it's not a financial emergency. We just want to take care of it right now while we can. And um, we'll see what happens during the summer. So I'm expecting the fact that we were flat in headcount is a good sign. That's the number of students. They just took fewer hours. And if Kingwood were fully functional, that we wouldn't have this issue at all right now. So, so it is what it is. We're just dealing with it financially. So. Any? I have a question on FEMA. I know you said they've done the site visit and you submitted data and et cetera. How, how long does it take to find out whether FEMA will, FEMA will actually award us for the cost? Is that anybody's guess? <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so, I mean, part of the holdup, so the first 9.6 million of project worksheets we've submitted, um, it did get kicked back to us. We're, we're still trying to figure out what the issues are. Part of the issue is the they've changed who our direct representative is. And so we've already kind of gone through a change of people that we're working with there and to get ramped back up. So um, I am not going to. I talked to the chancellor of the Louisiana system this past week. They still, um, FEMA owes them $40 million from Katrina. They yeah. still have it sitting out there. And uh, they're opening up two, two of their facilities now, just now. They're just now opening two of their facilities, and they've got more to come. I don't... 13 years ago. That was 12 years ago. 13. We're uh, 13. Okay. still talking about... I, I, the, the state continues to ask us for reports and how much damage. I just, I don't see any... Really, we're not counting on that, so we're, <coughs> we're putting our own plans together to move forward with this one way or another. So. Yeah, we update the state monthly. There is still FEMA claims working their way through for the Northeast from Superstorm Sandy. Okay. Um, one thing that's a little bit hard to kind of wrap your head around is that because of the nature of what FEMA does, there are very few set federal regulations that govern what they do. So the processes, procedures, and timelines get made up new after every disaster. No comment. Okay. No. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you.
trustees and chancellor. On behalf of the presidents, it's my great pleasure to present a report tonight on a topic that's near and dear to all of us. And you know, when Harvey hit in the fall, we, had, we were going in with great enrollments. We had already had our purge, so we had students paid for classes. But we know that the impact of Harvey was great. So just looking at it from the standpoint of how many claims have been filed by FEMA in our major zip codes, we actually looked at 68 of our most common zip codes that are in the, the colored area on the map that kind of corresponds roughly to the service areas of each of our six colleges. And looking at that map compared to the density of FEMA claims with the other map that's in pink. <clears throat> Notice that we had almost 200,000 FEMA cases impacting about a half a million people. Catherine, while you're there, I think that almost 200 is out of 600 and 50,000 taxable properties, something like that. Almost one third of our taxable properties had some sort of claim. So um, just looking at each one of these future slides, um, these are the disclaimers that it's only 68 of our most common zip codes. And these numbers do not match up with any of our daily enrollment reports. And we. We looked at these in terms of enrollments because students will take one course at one college, maybe another course elsewhere, and it's harder to split them by a head count. So here again is the heat map looking at, um, and you'll see this in each one of the next slides, but the darker the color represents more FEMA claims filed in that particular zip code. So when we look specifically at last spring, spring of 17, compared to spring of 18, we know, and these are numbers from last week, so we'll update this as we get our final official day record numbers. But we know that we're down in enrollment over 4,600. And you see the number of contact hours that we've been impacted from last spring to this spring. Again, noting the number of FEMA claims that have been filed and people impacted. And if we look at this by individual college area, so the um, all together in the Cypher area, and each of these colored maps actually have the colleges in alpha order. So Cypher is first, then Kingwood, Montgomery, North Harris, Tomball, and then University Park. So all together, the loss of 717 enrollments in the Cypher area come out of those zip codes that are the most heavily covered. We noticed that Kingwood and University Park actually saw increases in enrollments from those zip codes. Again, students swirl. They're all over. And we know at Kingwood, they're taking online. We can see how drastic, drastically different that is when we look at Kingwood. We see that many loss of enrollments. But most of the other colleges benefited, not SciFair. SciFair lost only seven enrollments from those zip codes, and um, Tomball lost 100. But Montgomery, North Harris, and University Park it picked up some enrollments from the Kingwood area. Again, with facilities, we we're assuming. When we look at Montgomery, and again, Montgomery was not as severely hit as some of the other areas in our district. Just interesting to look at the enrollment patterns from last spring to this spring. And University Park picked up enrollments in the Montgomery zip code. And North Harris was heavily hit. Notice 185,000 people impacted in the North Harris area and the only college that actually picked up enrollment from North Harris was University Park. So we know students swirl all the time, and these may not be the same exact students who were here the spring before, but it's just interesting to look at these patterns. Only Kingwood and University Park actually picked up students from the Tomball area. 
and Tomball, again, did not have as many homes damaged as some of the other zip code areas. And finally, University Park. And I think through all this you see that Montgomery and University Park actually did pick up enrollments this spring semester versus last spring semester. And that's showing as we look at these different patterns. So again, altogether we had over 4,600 fewer enrollments. The majority of those were at Kingwood and we believe those were directly related to facilities. We asked what was going on with some of our sister colleges. So this is the preliminary data that was sent to us. So we see a similar pattern at San Jacinto in that they're up in their head count or their head count was stable, but they're down in contact hours. And HCC reported they're both down in contact hours and head count for this spring versus last spring. Questions? I, I do have a question. Um, and this is, I guess, to all like the presidents from the, from the campuses. So when you have when you have students attending other campuses, does it does it create an issue for that particular campus because of overcrowdedness, or just or no? It's just there's no like often issue. often our students will take an online wherever they it's can find online. yeah wherever they can find it. They may take a course near one of the college campuses, but then. Um, depending upon where their work site is, decide to take another course elsewhere. So we know, I'd say, last figure I saw was something like 20% of our students That's about 20% of our students are taking classes at more than one college. So, but that's just because of the college, the way they are, where they work, it just depends. It just depends. Can we back up a couple slides to 66%? Yeah, yeah. Um, but Kingwood picked up colleges. I'm sorry. I mean, but Kingwood picked up students. Kingwood lost actually um, thought, this yeah. spring. We lost two percent in our headcount and thirteen percent okay. in our contact hours. In the okay. fall, yes. In the fall, right. oh, in the okay. fall we did pick up. Okay. Right. Yeah. Fall really was an anomaly. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions? Well, you know, I'm not really sure. Follow up. situations and corrective action done. So my summary of the matter is it's because of the results of your staff and those folks working hard to make sure the students were aware of what was going on. Thank you. I agree. I work with miracle workers every day. And I couldn't do it unbelievable. Thank you. So Catherine, just so for my own, so the head count today or Tuesday, yesterday was, uh, before yesterday, was... Minus 2% for Kingwood. But we're flat across the system for head count. Yes. So, but the enrollments, are you counting enrollments here or head count? The, the enrollment, these look at enrollments, but enrollment, credit hours, and contact hours okay. all went just, down. Just for the board's sake. So, student head count is one thing, but if they enroll in three classes, we look at it different ways. So if they enroll in three classes, that's like three enrollments. So what happens is the head count is the same, but they're enrolling for few, fewer classes, especially over at Kingwood. I think, did you do the study that showed that they were down about one? Or maybe that was your area that showed that they were down about one, one enrollment. So when you see, when I'm, when I'm telling you that the enrollments, the head count is flat, the enrollment is down because they're taking fewer courses. Does yeah. that make sense? Oh, yeah. Which means the contact hours yeah. are down. That, and the bottom line is for us is for our state, the state appropriations is the contact hours. Yeah. And for internal purposes, that's going to be the enrollments for tuition and fees and the amount of money that they pay. Mm -hmm. Any way you look at it, it's uh, Actually, we're down tuition way, and fees. And so. to me, it's promising that we have this many head counts. I, I, and, I agree, and we know by the, the way, number of contact positive. hours is because of their circumstances related to Harvey. We'll see. What happens is, um, what I'm hoping is that people, I mean, Kingwood has massive damage to it. It just does. And they're still trying to get back on their feet. So what we're hoping is this summer we'll start seeing 
And we'll know during the summer term if we can compare the enrollment. And we'll be able to tell as we start enrolling for the fall how things are looking. Yeah. I, I think we've come through the worst of this. I really do. And I think our enrollments will go back up. That's the reason I think our budgeting issues are just temporary. And it's just making an adjustment now and not, um, like I said, it's not a crisis. We just want to, you saw, maybe some of you didn't see the note I sent out. It's just like what happens at your house sometimes. And you just have to make the adjustment and pay for it and move on. So. On a good note, we got to move into the downstairs of the admin building today from NSAID. If you haven't, uh, I'm not sure where the board receives Catherine's notes or not, but are you at 150 or something? Day 150? I've, I've lost um, track. Day 150 was Monday. So yeah. every... Good day number 150. She doesn't do it every day anymore, but she sends out regular notices if you want to be included on that. So you can, you can get an up to the hour status report if you would like. Thank you. I think I know the answer, but as we make progress at King, you know, rebuilding and et cetera, I presume that we're going to make sure that everybody in the community knows from month to month or peer to peer exactly what the status is of everything. And I know that's happening, but I, I just wanted to hear a verification of that. I Helen, we probably need to get a, an article about this. Uh, I'm looking at you, but it, Where's the coordinator? Is she still? Yeah. I do reports to the chamber and to the area rotaries, but um, uh, I do reports to the chambers and the various rotaries, but yeah, we can do a publication as well. Well, I wasn't trying to create work. I just want to make sure <laughs> no. you, know that, you know that folks are kept up to date. And when the build backs occurred, we'll certainly have a lot of celebrations going on. They like to do the work. It's job security. So, uh, okay. All right. I think we ought to do it. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. Okay. Because we have this shortfall, are we beefing up our recruitment and outreach and stuff like that? Yes, we are. Okay. Just I'll come back. Uh, matter of <laughs> fact, beforehand, I asked Kellen to make sure the president's knew what Port Nevis. Port Nevis already come forth with a plan. We're talking. We've already been meeting with our firm. I, I personally was involved in that, and we went down to Houston. We've been meeting with our marketing group. Uh, our outside marketing group and our internal. She just started a month ago, I think that's what, and so she's, she's already got a plan of action. You'll start seeing a lot more of us everywhere. Yes. Excellent. Any other questions? No. Thank you. Thank you. Remember that? Yeah, that's All right. Yes, sir. All right.
That was Welcome Back, Cotter, a TV comedy from about 1975 to 1979. And this is uh, this this began as a as Grammy Grammy Awards week, and I'm a mass communications teacher at Lone Star College North Harris, so I thought we'd start with a song. The song uh, is only part of it. You know, uh, my mass communications includes the other stuff too, the TV show. This show has some lessons for us. Forty. Uh, this was this was actually uh, done by. The song was done by John Sebastian, who won a Grammy Award himself in 1976. So that's 42 years now. About as long as some of our North Harris faculty members have been there. Boy, I never think. So <laughs> the show uh, was touted as being in the fourth largest city in America, which they said was Brooklyn. But Brooklyn is part of New York, so it doesn't count. But very similarly, we're the fourth largest city. The song lyrics talk about the students having dreams. And the show itself is about a student returning to the school he attended to help the new generation. That new generation at his school was called the Sweat Hogs. And they had a remedial class. But Gabe Cotter, Mr. Cotter, the teacher, wouldn't give up. And I, I just, when I was looking at the Grammy Awards and I was thinking about how much time has passed and I saw some of this video footage and the way they dressed and as much as things change, I was surprised at how much they stay the same. They're the same people, different clothing. Check out some of our North Harris employees from about 1976. Some of those are in the room today. I don't know if you can figure out which ones are standing here. But they're not giving up on their students. Here are some of the names, if you can make them out. And many of these folks are still here. Many of them still remain. Every semester, they welcome back a new batch of students. I can see some of you studying it recognizing colleagues. Well, with, with all of our uh, enrollment numbers, one of the cool things for North Harris is that we actually have posted a gain from last spring to this spring. We're actually going up and improving on our second semester enrollment. We are the green line, the bottom one. So this is what I want to talk about. I just, you know, I want to focus on North Harris, where I'm at tonight, and <clears throat> some reasons why our students return. We're, we are at a, uh, we didn't see an enrollment climb. We're, we're flat right now, but as I said, we, we are, you know, compared to last spring, we're doing pretty good. So one of the things is the place. You know, in journalism, by the way, which is part of mass communications, we, we talk about minding your P's and Q's. Maybe you heard your grandmother, your, your grandfather tell you to mind your P's and Q's. That's a journalism term. It goes back to when we had the little block letters with the, with the lowercase p and the lowercase q. They looked alike when they were backwards on the block, the printing block, and you'd had to, you had to be careful. You had to mind your P's and Q's when you put them back in the box because you wouldn't want to mix them up. So I thought about it, and you know, when you talk about why students return, I think we can, we can call it our P's and Q's. The quality of our places, our people, and our programs. These are like, these are what I like to call the, the P's and Q's. So one of them is the places. You know, we have the North Harris main campus, our Greens Point Victory Centers, our Health Professions Building, Chi, our partner there, and we have attractive, convenient locations. We're in a major city. We're, we're by roads and highways and metro stops, and we provide our students 
metro discounts. But also the people. And I want to talk about a few of the outstanding people we have tonight. On the left, you'll see Dr. Rajrani Sharma. She is our, one of our nursing professors. And her late husband, Professor Pradeep Leal, on the right. We have been trying to raise $15,000. We had been trying to raise $15,000 to have an endowed scholarship in another professor's name, the late Ray Moler, a computer instructor. And he passed away probably about 13 years ago now. While he was alive, he was one of those caring professors who went the bat for the student and for our campus. And he raised funds to create the fountain that we have at North Harris today. He raised funds for that fountain. And the system actually dedicated that fountain to him, and it's in his name today. So faculty wanted to honor him by raising funds for a scholarship of $1,000 each year into perpetuity. If you raise 15,000, the interest will take care of itself, and every year you'll be able to give another thousand away. But we had a deadline to do that, and our deadline was December. Faculty had been raising money for about a decade, but we were still short, and we faced a deadline of December 31st. And Dr. Sharma, who goes by Rani, said, let's just do this. And there was a considerable gap, and she called me up, and she, she took care of it in the name of her late husband, Pradeep. So this is the kind of people we have at North Harris. One of the reasons people come back. This is Professor Ray Moller. So starting this year, at the end of the year, we'll be able to give out, well, in, in, uh, in the fall semester, we'll be able to give out a $1,000 scholarship from the Ray Moller Endowment. Now, we have another uh, way to assist our students, and this is the Faculty Senate's Student Emergency Fund, largely from faculty donations, and fortunately from Dr. Head, we were able to uh, get some assistance through the Jakarta Discretionary Funds, and he provided some uh, considerable contributions to our fund and the other campuses, faculty senate funds. Well, we've been helping our students, and one student we, we learned was living in his car. That was his routine. It wasn't just for any financial crisis. That was his routine. He was living in his car because he couldn't live at home. And he was in our LVN program, the Licensed Vocational Nurse Program. And if you stay in that, you can get to the registered nurse program. So he, com he completed the LVN program from his car every day, but didn't have money for an apartment. And part of the reason why he didn't have that much money every month was because he didn't have a solid job for that income. So a faculty member brought him up to the faculty senate who learned of his case. He had a plan, and his plan was that if he, if he could only get through the LVN courses, take the national tests for nursing certification, he would be able to get a real LVN job, continue his education, get the RN, and you know, have, a, have his lifelong career. So he did it. He got through his LVN classes. He did really well. His teacher went to bat for him, mentioned him to the faculty senate, committee met and we decided to fund him for the cost to take two national tests, a jurisprudence exam and the LVN national certification exam. We took them both, he passed, he was so excited. This is his message of thank you by email. I'm ecstatic to have made it this far. I have just two more steps to go and that's to uh, you know, do the registered nurse program. He is now working at an area hospital as an LVN while he still works on his RN. So this is why they come back. 
We also have other great folks, and you'll learn, you'll see these folks next month at our system-wide award ceremony. These are our Faculty Excellence Award winners. There are four of them, and you can see the names across the bottom there. We recognize them locally, and then uh, they have the system presentation next month. We also have our Adjunct Faculty Award winners. Same story, we've recognized them locally, and then they will be recognized next month. These are our PSSA, the Professional Staff and Support Association winners. We also have a national award winner. Gary Connors was selected by a faculty committee to be our national award winner for the Roosh uh, Award. And this is uh, given by the League for Innovation in the Community College. And he gets a ticket to the National Conference in Washington, D.C. We also have a statewide award winner, Michael McFarland. And Michael McFarland is one of those folks who would have seen the original Welcome Back Cotter on TV. <laughs> he has been at North Harris since the very, uh, almost the very beginning. Uh, so he's uh, in, ex ex in excess of 42 years himself. And he was selected to be our Piper Award nominee from Lone Star College North Harris. So he's a two-time nominee. So very happy to have him. He, he He's one who wears many hats. And our folks uh, take the show on the road sometimes. These are librarians from our main campus who took the makerspace equipment over to the Victory Center to uh, share them with the students over there. Makerspace is a whole bunch of stuff from 3D printers to arts and crafts to uh, architectural design size printers where students can really create. And sometimes the teachers work those projects into the instruction so that while they're creating, they're taking notes and they might write an essay explaining how to use that equipment. Or they might write an essay on how to create that kind of project. Mayor Turner stopped by. So when it comes to people, it's our community connections as well. When we gave the students an opportunity around Thanksgiving to indicate to us what they were thankful for, we videotaped it. Let's see who they seem to indicate over and over throughout the day.
put this under programs because this video was created under one of our new programs. This entire slide is about a Title V grant that we received. A few million dollars. And it's renewable after five years. But right now, it's really helping us out. So systems help with the grant application enabled us to get this Title V set of programs. The multimedia studio was, was the one that created the video you just saw. But we have a studio with a green screen, so we can do all kinds of projects in there, an entire room. And so far, they've produced 15 video shoots, helping instructors, some online, and several of them are in progress. Library 2.0 is multimedia stuff in the library, including Makerspace, and that has had 2,604 visits so far. The Career Lab, so that they can look forward to and connect to jobs, 769 <coughs> visits so far. We have had 20 different events for Hispanic parents to help learn how to support their students in college. The Faculty Institute is held every semester, and this time, because of Title V, we were able to fly in a speaker on how the brain and teaching connect. And the adjunct boot camp we have every semester, and now we can pay the instructors, those adjuncts, to come for that day of training through the Title V grant not from Lone Star funding. We talk about tutoring classes. Well, those tutors go to classes, not the other way around in this program. We've had 500 class visits made by those tutors, 300 students served. We help with their transition into college, 809 students assisted there. We redesigned the reading one and writing one classes to combine them. Reading is connected to writing. And writing across the curriculum, we've combined English with history, so now they learn how to write their papers about the discipline they're learning. Summer Math Bridge, we've increased the numbers of students coming into college to 56% of those we reach out to. That's up 6% from the previous year. And for the last two years, that's up about 30-some percent. We also now can offer a bilingual interpreter certificate. And we mentor our adjuncts. So full-time instructors now mentor adjuncts. And adjuncts go to visit their classes to see how they do it. And because of Title V, we can provide stipends for both both the full-timer as well as the adjunct. Also speaking about our programs, we've got some wonderful passage rates in health professions. Certified medical assistant, they passed at a rate of 92%. Our LVNs, we just got word on that, 100%. And the same with our advanced EMT students, 100%. Mm. This is a play done by our drama classes, Hand to God. And they performed that last semester, and they're doing an encore presentation this semester, because they were chosen, the only community college chosen to perform for the Kennedy Center American College Theater Regional Festival, San Angelo University next month. And it's actually a competition. They could be selected there to go perform in Washington. Speaking also about our programs, one of our students at Chi, Natasha Roberts, had a three-day training event and those instructors selected her to compete nationally in Las Vegas at the North American Hairstylist Competition. 
This is Ryan Jialu, a student of mine from years back. We started with Gabe Cotter, the teacher in Welcome Back Cotter, who returned to his student, uh, returned to his school as an employee. This is our Gabe Cotter. Ryan Giallo has now returned to North Harris. He's been there a few years now working as an employee. He is our talent search recruiter. And I want to introduce him as one of our good people because I'm going to show you another brief video. And Ryan was our cameraman, our production person for this next video. Uh, assisted by his professor, Dr. Kendall Lawrence. We used this for convocation last fall. Dr. Napolis, we don't want to be late for convocation. No, so let's go. This is why our students return. <laughs> Excellent job. Enjoy yeah. that. Thank you. <coughs> One question. You mentioned the uh, Summer Math Bridge program. Is that the program where students, I guess, <clears throat> are not where they should be mathematically, yeah. and over the summer they get training so that they can go directly into college algebra or college math? That's a tough one for me. I'm, I'm not sorry. Sure of the ins and outs. Dr. Nicholas, is that right? What is the bridge program? It's, it's, it's a program so the uh, high school students when they come to class, they're ready for the, the next level of math. And so it's kind of a supplemental and substitute format. So Dr. Head was part of the uh, celebration this past summer. And it's also coordinated with our North Harris Council and the Business Alliance. So we work with our highest. Just a bridge from high school to college. That's all. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's how I understood it. You didn't yeah. want to get it wrong. Yeah. yeah. That's what I thought, so I just want to make sure. Keep up the good work. Any questions, comments? I'm going to save that picture for a long that uh, video, Dr. Napolis, for. <laughs> I'm going to show your uh, daughter one of these days. What, uh, <laughs> <laughs> he asked me if he could show the convocation video. I thought he talked he meant the one in spring. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, my yeah. 
That's thank fine. you. Thank you so much. It's okay. Your career is still safe. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, he's pretty cool, isn't he? Oh, yeah. That's good. That's, uh... <laughs> okay, board members, are there any meetings, conferences that you attended that you would like to make the uh, body aware of over the last two months? Any conference meetings, programs, civic activities? And I know Ken has something. Yeah, I, 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 I attended the Stella E. Kingwood and my wife and I were both amazed and amused by the music because it was such a small group but very dynamic. Okay. And, and the jazz was top. So awesome. Well, I thought you were going to mention yes. also about Crystalline Lloyd, <laughs> who is the daughter of somebody by the name of Ken Lloyd. And uh, she is a Grammy Award winner. That was on TV that Monday night, Tuesday night, or whatever. Yeah, and, and uh, she's pretty here. And she's Ken pretty here. Yeah. I'll just say there is a God. Yeah. <laughs> I, she is one of three. You couldn't give me a million dollars for any of them, but I'd be reluctant to pay ten bucks for another one just like that. <laughs> but not. I'm just. That's a joke. Well, but she Ken is. did say that talent was generational skipping. <laughs> well, well, I, I want to say this now that uh, Belton is here. I, we had our ethnicity and DNA done, and we're twenty five percent Cameroon. So maybe that's where she. Ah, okay. From. All right. Well, great job. Congratulations, <laughs> Ron. Yeah, I just um, next Wednesday I've been asked to speak at an orientation for state legislators. I don't know why in the hell they ask me. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. I'm going to go. Okay, you, you can't you can't stop me. I'm going to be in a panel with Raymond uh, per, uh, Paredes, who is the commissioner of higher education, and also on the panel with Senator Charles Schwartzner, who's on the State Affairs Committee. That's really the most important committee in the Senate. It's not the Higher Education Committee. It's the State Affairs Committee. And the thing that's good about Schwarzner is that he's not necessarily a status quo guy. He's willing to do some tough stuff. And I like that. And what I'm going to talk about, what I'm really ultimately going to do, is defend, to defend community colleges. Now, you would think that's a given among here, but it's not. University costs are going to continue to rise unabated. And the reason for that is that there will always be in Texas more than enough wealthy parents to pay for it. So they want their kids to succeed, and they figure that going to prestigious schools is the answer. Universities are becoming more and more and more just for rich kids. And it's going to give, become even more so that way because middle class people even simply cannot afford anymore to send their kids to their colleges. Now, one of the things I'm going to talk about over there, I may get run out of town on the rail, but the legislature favors universities, acts on behalf of universities, defers to universities far more than to community colleges, and they do it for political reasons. No legislator can take on the University of Texas or A&M if you touch them with a 10-foot pole, their machines will run you out of office. And yet I point out to you that the endowment for the University of Texas is $26.5 billion. <coughs> the endowment for Texas A&M is $11.5 billion. 
They are the wealthiest public schools in the world. And yet, they say, we need to increase <coughs> tuition. Oh, the hell they do. They just want to increase it. Why? Because universities are a cartel. They will raise it because the school next door will, the school next door will, and the school next door will. And that cartel is going, is going to survive. I'm going to talk about this and some other stuff, but I'm going to focus on the last half on in fact saying to those folks, why don't you turn your attention, I don't have anything against wealthy kids, but why don't you turn your attention from wealthy kids to other kids? Why don't you start at the middle class and work your way down? After all, the poor kids or the middle class kids constitute the majority of students in this country. So why don't you focus there? And that's simply what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to say. Uh, I'm going to be very candid with them. But somebody, you've got to keep trying to talk to the legislator to say, acknowledge more than rich kids and rich parents, even if politically you might suffer because of that. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. Anybody else? I have just two brief comments to make. Over the holidays, my husband and I traveled to Germany, and the hotel that we stayed in, several of the employees were refugees. One that we got quite friendly with was a refugee from Afghanistan, and another was from Ghana. Both of these young men were employees because they were participants in internship programs, in hospitality programs in local colleges. And um, they were, I think, three-year programs. And it was really fascinating to talk to them about how they had been welcomed into that area and what those educational opportunities were doing for them. And the other comment I'd like to make is <clears throat> having survived not one but two go-rounds of the flu since Thanksgiving, if you haven't had your flu shot, please get it. And please insist on the quadrivalent version. What? The quadrivalent, it protects against four strains. We have 11 weeks to go in this season. <laughs> Good, great comment. All right. OK, I just wanted to announce that in addition to being a trustee, I'm also a student. <laughs> I, I signed up for a course. Uh, I haven't taken a class in uh, over 15 years. So I forgot how to take a class. <laughs> Thank you, Rebecca Riley, Dr. Riley, for uh, kind of guiding me along. Um, if it weren't for that winter storm we had, I would have missed the deadline. So that was my first problem. <laughs> That's where I, I remember. I, when I missed it, and it says, oh, excellent. So, okay, that was my first, my first, uh, you know, issue, <laughs> my personal issue. <laughs> and the campus experience was awesome, just, just walking up. That was the only campus I had, you know, and I had told you I still needed to visit your college, and so I, I, I went all, all out. I decided to go ahead and take a class. <laughs> the, um, by the way, the name of the class, it's a creative writing, and it's with David Parsons. I don't even know. Does he know I'm a, I'm a trustee? He knows that. I'm curious. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't said anything. I haven't said anything. It's better. You're I'll, not I'll, obligated <laughs> to tell the truth, I, Rebecca. I didn't think so. I didn't think so. He's got a tough, tough, tough course. He's no. He, he's a great uh, a teacher and um, it's a very, real good positive learning experience. And simply walking up there and you immediately get a sense that uh, you know. Teachers there are caring, they're talking to students. You get that sense. It's a beautiful campus. Um, and uh, the, um, one of the other things in a, a, that, I, that happened is um, I walk in and I, I want to know where my syllabus is, you know, my paper copy. And of <laughs> course, it's online. 
And I thought I was very, you know, advanced on this stuff. And then I said, okay, so where do I go again? <laughs> so anyway, so, but, but I, I got through that first week and I've already been through classes, two, uh, two, two sessions or what is it called? Two um, sessions? <laughs> Days. Uh, so thank you very much. Just want to announce that. You took a class. Anybody else, huh? Aren't you taking a class? Well, I'm getting ready to report out right now. A uh, couple of things happened over the holiday. Well, more than a couple of things I'll mention, too. Last Saturday night, I was invited to be the guest speaker over in Tumball for a bunch of Boy Scout leaders and Boy Scouters. And it was a great event. I think there was a couple hundred people there. And so I made my usual speech and hung around for a while. And do you know, and I wasn't surprised, everybody wanted to talk about Leanne Nutt's performance and what great person she is and et cetera. And I told them that I would officially mention it at a meeting so that the chancellor and his staff can take whatever actions are necessary for her doing such a great job. <laughs> and so, uh, so she's doing, everybody spoke very, very, very highly, you know, of Lone Star. And I'm very, very proud of what all of you guys do in the community. And the fact of the matter is, I don't get any negative comments from anybody except students that make Fs. And I can't, can't help them too much. So, so keep up the good work. Secondly, uh, I decided that I wanted to win a Grammy in three years. <laughs> so Helen, Shaw, and et cetera assisted me because I couldn't read more than technology. I hadn't read more than technology. I didn't know how to register. So I am now a registered Lone Star student. And I'm taking guitar lessons. <laughs> I'm the only person in the class of 20 that can't read music. And uh, so I'm having to catch up. But it's a great class, great facility. I'm enjoying it. And, and at the end of one year of training, I am going to, if permitted, play a solo to this group of people. <laughs> So that, I can, so, that I can, so that I can prepare for my, prepare my Grammy resume. <laughs> I'm still not preparing it, but, but it's great. I'm, in, I'm enjoying it. The classes, if you want to come watch me, it's 6 to 9.30 p.m. <laughs> on Monday evening. So that's all I have. I, I Is, anybody else? Well, I sat next to him at the Michael Jackson concert. I can't speak for your guitar playing, but I know how you sing, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I tell you, I, I plan to get that Grammy in guitar playing only. That's my best chance. <laughs> uh, so, no, I, I sing all the time, though, especially in the shower. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? 